everyone. It's your girl, Miss Sam Little Cool. I said I would come back later on today. But if you all know, I have a horrible case of insomnia. So I was supposed to come back in the afternoon, but I didn't. So I am here now. Many people who are young, born in the 90s, in the 2000s, they, not, they may not know this event in history. If you're born in the 80s, you know it. But you don't remember it because either you were an infant or you weren't born yet. But if you were born in the 70s, particularly the early to mid 70s, and if you were born in the 60s and beyond, you remember December the 8th, 1980. One of the worst days in music history. And I would say one of the worst days in the United States and around the world even. This is a day when... Rock and roll superstar, and I would say icon, John Lennon was assassinated. You know, every time I think about it, it's really hurtful because he was assassinated in a city where he chose to live. And he wanted to live because he said that New York was the most safest place. And the most safest city to be in. And when I tell you he adapted the New York culture and lifestyle, he not only adapted, he embraced it and he became a part of the culture. John Lennon was assassinated in front of his building. He lives in the Dakota. Now, another music star, um, R&B superstar, Roberta Flack, she lived there as well. But he was the most famous New Yorker in the 70s and in 1980. At the time when he was assassinated, John Lennon was making a huge comeback. His song Starting Over was about to be go- was about to be number 1 and he had just released his album Double Fantasy after a 5-year hiatus due to choosing to be a house husband. And raising his young younger son, Sean. Now, many people who are Beatles fans, I'm a huge Beatles fan. You know, I know it's odd. I'm a huge Beatles fan. Many Beatles fans at the time welcomed the comeback. And what was fun about it was that he was making a lot of press. He was doing a lot of interviews. He was doing promotions. And many people said that the album was going to be a huge hit, which it did become. But it was something else about it. And what it was is that he was a 40-year-old man who proved that life after 40, you can still have it. You can have, you know, what we call in the the hood game, you know, some people in, in the white world, They call it, you know, like he's still hot, you know, he got the steam, you know, but we call game. John Lennon had game. A lot of people don't really know that. If you know, if you know of John Lennon and you watch his interviews and you watch how he would basically conduct himself, John Lennon had game. I'm just going to come out and say it. I know. But what he was also known for post Beatles, he was known for being an activist, not just a peace activist. But he supported many causes, particularly in the black community. And it was two major ones he supported. He supported the Black Panther Party. Particularly, he supported Bobby Seale. He was an advocate for free lunch programs. He was an advocate for black people being a... Now, I don't want to say just a protected class, but he supported black people's fight for liberation in this country and for the United States government to acknowledge it. He had a huge disdain for J. Edgar Hoover. That's what made him be a trusted person and ally in the community. And he also financially supported a lot of causes as well. Many people don't know this, but another thing that he supported was ends in poverty in the black community, particularly when it came to children. You might have heard a song called... um, it's, it's a Christmas song. And it's, it's, it's I love the song. It's, it's a Christmas song. 
And it's him, Yoko, and his son, Julian. But it also features the Harlem Children's Choir. He was heavily involved with the youth and, and, and really working to get the recognition known. And going to, like, you know, City Hall, going to... And not just even going, but even writing, giving interviews about poverty in New York, particularly amongst black children. And one of the things that he and Yokel did in 1978, they made a huge donation to a woman named that was known as Mother Hale. So if you're from the NYC area, I'm sure you know about Mother Hale and you know about Hale House. And because of that donation, it helped to get Hale, Hale House to become internationally prominent. And it did help a lot of women while Mother Hill was alive. But the story after she passed away, it was just really horrible. And Yoko Ono, she pulled out her money. And even after John Lennon passed away, they were still donating. The the, the um, estate was donating to the Hale House. But there was something that happened with John Lennon. And it wasn't after the Beatles broke up, it was during the height of Beatlemania. In 1965, John Lennon gave an interview with a British magazine, and they were talking about different things. He was talking about philosophy. He was discussing, you know, what it's like to be famous and to be like a global cessation and have young girls, you know, love and adore you and have, you know, young guys want to emulate you so he gave his he gave his you know commentary and he gave his um, point of view they even discussed Nietzsche's um the philosophy he even talked about a lot of things and he made a quote and it was just a remark that the Beatles are more popular than Jesus and that the public was more infatuated with the band than Jesus. And that Christian faith was declined to the extent that it might be outlasted by rock music. Now, that was his opinion. You know, he wasn't trying to. Oh, by the way, it was 1966. It was 1966. I want to say that. It was 1966. And it wasn't anything big because in England... It was like, okay, all right, you know, that's your opinion. And he was talking about it all over the world. But the South and the Bible Belt states, they had an issue with it. And what they did was they got their children and their grandchildren to burn records of the Beatles. And they held a protest during the 1966 U.S. tour. And the audacity of the Ku Klux Klan had the nerve to even picket their concerts. They publicly burned press, press releases. And you can see video footage. You can look it up. And these are the children who were also those of the, of the, of the people who were abusing blacks, lynching blacks, sticking dogs on us, doing all heinous things, but had the audacity to be Christians and love Jesus. And that was the beginning of John Lennon being a target. And I'm going to say this, it set the foundation for John Lennon's assassination. Because they didn't get at the whole group. They got at him because he was the one that made the statement. So he began to be a target. Then he married Yoko, a non-white woman who was rich from a rich family from Japan. Then he got involved in being an anti-war activist. He was like really hugely against the Vietnam War. Then he aligned himself with supporting black causes and then also other causes too you know he even supported you know women's rights he also supported also native american rights believe it or not this was a real this in my opinion he was a real one i'm just gonna come out and say it john lennon was a real one he really was and you know what i'm gonna say something 
I always believe that another reason why those southern those protesters in the in the South had those children to destroy those records was because the Beatles always was cool with black artists, particularly blues artists, particularly certain like like artists from the fifties. Stands, um, except for um, Little Richard because he couldn't stand any of them. Chuck Berry was cool with them, they co signed them, and they were not racist at all. And a lot of those acts from England, they were not racist. And a lot of the children were learning and seeing how these people are embraced are from the other side of the pond and they embrace black music, and yet, and still, they're not even trying to be black. And in their lyrics, they're talking about peace, you know, working together, you know, like putting on aside all this nonsense. And my parents are these KKK members, these white supremacists, and I really don't think like them. But they still, as far as the parents, have to instill white supremacy values into their children. And they made those children do that. Most of the children who were alive like 30 years, 40 years, they gave interviews and they said that. We were doing that because our parents and our grandparents and even the churches had us to do it because they saw the Beatles and the whole British invasion as a threat due to the fact that they were aligning themselves with black people and then black causes. So later on throughout John Lennon's life, especially when he wasn't producing music, he was still talked about. He was still popular. He would walk down the streets of New York and he would basically talk to people, high five people. And my mother literally was a friend of, of Miles Davis, okay? And John Lennon used to go to the house of, John, of Miles Davis. And my mother missed meeting John Lennon by two minutes because she had got off of work late because she had to do paperwork. Otherwise, my mother would have met John Lennon. This is the type of person he was. He was not a racist stiff. You know, a lot of these white artists that you have today... They could learn something from John Lennon. You know, when I hear people praising Justin Bieber, when I hear people praising, um, who else? Let me, let me, uh, another racist. Oh, I, I, I question Molly Cyrus, you know? Also, all these other white are, oh, Justin Timberlake, baby. Justin Timberlake, definitely. People that we call culture vultures. If John Lennon was alive, John Lennon would set all their asses straight. All of them saying, all of them like appropriating black culture and then not only not giving back, but then wanting to put it down, they would have got caught. He would have called all of their asses out. Yes, I said it. He would have called all of their asses out. And another thing too, is that Mark David Chapman, I do believe, I'm going to say this. I do believe Mark David Chapman was one that people what did shoot did shoot him, but I have followed the case and I've done my research. It is alleged that it was another marksman. It's an alle- allegation because if you ever look at the glasses and you ever look at the bullet holes, there was a bullet hole at the door of the Dakota. Mark David Chapman shot him face to face. It was it was. He was in the front. He didn't go and he didn't do it like a coward move. But the question is, why was there a gunshot? Why was there, why was glass, why was there broken glass at the Dakota when according to, you know, the detective's work, the bullet never ricocheted? The bullet never ricocheted. And another thing too about Mark David Chapman, I do believe that he was sent there to assassinate John Lennon. And another reason too, and you know how I am about my conspiracy theories, and I'm gonna keep this clean, but I'm gonna also say this in coded language. For all my history heads, did you pick up or really notice how John Lennon was assassinated one month after the 1980 presidential election. That's all I'm going to say. Notice that. After the 1980 
presidential election that many evangelical Christians voted, was, was campaigning for and got what they wanted. The same people who started the whole, I hate the Beatles, mainly I hate John Lennon, you know, movement that I would say set the tone, set the foundation for the, his assassination. One month later, he gone. One month later, he gone. And now it's been 41 years and he's been gone longer than he was alive on this plane. But every year, every year, people commemorate his life and his legacy, his music, his activism, his awareness for civil rights, economic justice, political justice, because even he as a white man who was a multimillionaire, he had to fight to become a permanent resident in this country. That's how much of a threat he was deemed to be. They tried everything on him. They was like, oh, you know, he smokes weed. Oh, you know, he does this. Oh, you know, he's, he's, he, you know, he, he's a philosopher. He, he's very subversive. He's, and he was deemed literally at one time to be very dangerous. Just like they saw Martin Luther King as dangerous and Malcolm X. They saw him as that because there's one thing that many people don't know is that there are entities that don't want people to come together, okay? I'm just going to be honest. There is groups of people, and I'm going to be honest with you, they white. They white. And it's entities and it's shadows, governments, that don't want us as people in general, particularly those that have a strong message of unity, they don't want us to unite. Like in the song, um, Imagine, there's a line. You may say, I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will live as one. You know, that's one of my favorite songs, but it was one of my mom's favorite songs. And I don't want to say it, but um, a lot of that, particularly in the 1970s, there was a reaction of children who were born in World War II, children who were born during the silent generation and the baby boom generation that they were rejecting religion, traditional religion concepts in this country, because many of those religions cause self hate cause, cause, um, discrimination. A lot of black people were rejecting Christianity. They were going to Islam or they were just going to, you know, some of them would be in Buddhist. Some of them would just like, I'm just going to be myself. I don't want to deal with any religion. And that's what he was talking about, no religion too. Imagine there's no, like, there's no heaven, even though a lot of religious people are against it. And Ben Shapiro, he's one of the people against it. But the reality is that song, I think everybody should listen to it again because I had to listen to it today to really question, was it a song that was promoting globalism or was it a song that was just saying, hey, you know, Let's put all this BS aside and let's just come together and let's just, you know, be a better people, be a better world. Even though I will say we can't as black people do that until we get recompense for the injustices that was been upon our people, our ancestors, and then even including us, both economically, politically, socially, psychologically. And also, believe it or not, I say this, I say even the sexual abuse that a lot of us have suffered, you know, eugenics and, and things like that and education and jobs. But I understood where he was coming from. And like, to me, I feel that as though if he was still alive, a lot of the things that happened in this country, because he was definitely going to stay here. He was not leaving. And he was definitely going to be, he was definitely staying in New York because y'all go still live in New York. I believe that he would have called out a lot of governments, officials, and what we're seeing now with the, with the mandates, he would be against it. I believe that he, a lot of stuff, I, this is my opinion, I believe a lot of stuff would not have happened. I believe a lot of things would not have happened. 
And it's really funny that he was popular at the time when both Martin Luther King and Malcolm X were still alive. He was famous. And he was always known as the rebel. He was always known as the person that was a free thinker. And it's just a shame that B is saying one thing that he thought was comfortable in his own country to say, they took it to make a statement of, we got to X him out. We got to X a group out, but we really got to get him because he's a problem. And this proves my point about evangelical white Christians. But more importantly, his music still lives on. His legacy continues. And Mark David Chapman ain't never going to get out of prison. And Yoko was seeing to it, and so are the fans. And I'm going to say, as a person who's a New Yorker, lifelong New Yorker, I've actually visited Strawberry Fields. I will, I've always walked past Dakota, passed by Dakota. And yes, even though there are some, some stories that they say about Dakota, I've never been there. I don't want to be going there. I have my opinions. You still feel the presence of him around Strawberry Fields. You feel the presence of him on 72nd Street because that's where the building was. And he will always go to the park. He will go there with Yoko. And then when Sean was born, he would go there with Sean. And another thing, too, a lot of people don't know this is that Yoko and Michael Jackson were very good friends. Now, I don't know if him and Michael were friends, but Michael Jackson was the godfather, what, father, is a godfather of Sean Lennon. And... I'm not going to talk about what I was going to talk about. I'll talk about that in another video. But um, this is my commentary commemorating the life of John Lennon. Yes, this is the 40th first anniversary of assassination. And I was going to do a commentary last year for the 40th. But if you've been following a lot of stuff that I've been going through, I wasn't able to do it. So this is making up for the 40th one. But this is one that's hard. This is one that's like poignant because it's officially more years of him being gone than he lives on this earth and I will be posting video um um pictures of you know how he looked the last couple of days because I think it's very important but another thing that he did challenge just before he passed away ageism in the music industry was literally about to be cut off and he paved the way for that which gave for artists such as Marvin Gaye Tina Turner and then later on, all those others have staying power. And with, with that, and also another thing too, I also want to say that um, I also want to say that a lot of artists now who are particularly liberal, they need to pay their respect. I'm talking about the white boys. They need to pay their respects to John Lennon because if it wasn't for John Lennon, taking the heat for what he was saying back in the day, they wouldn't be able to freely say what they're saying and still have successful careers and be superstars with staying power. And with that being said, sugar, I'm going to send a little call. Yes, I am signing all out. I want to thank everybody for listening to this commentary. I know it's pretty long, but it means a lot to me. And I know there's John Lennon fans out there. And thank you and take care and have a wonderful night. And if you are a fan... I suggest you listen to Imagine Instant Karma. Um, what's another song that he had? What gets you through the night? Whatever gets you through the night is all right. And that's that's one. Of the, those are the songs that I would say. Oh, and all we need is give peace a chance. And the Christmas song. That's a very the ver that's a very song. That's a very beautiful song. Take care and good night.